Welcome to episode 824 of CXO Talk. We're discussing supply chains with two world experts. Ted Stank is co-executive director of the Global Supply Chain Institute. And Bill Simon is the former CEO of Walmart USA. Ted, tell us about the Global Supply Chain Institute at the University of Tennessee and tell us about your work. Global Supply Chain Institute is a unit of our Department of Supply Chain Management. It's really the part that deals with all of our industry outreach. We have about 80 partners, 80 industry partners, um, and we do everything from executive MBA programs with them, certification programs, so a lot of education. I help, uh, I help run and facilitate all those different outreach arms. Bill, you were former CEO of Walmart US and have a long history in supply chains. And so tell us about that. Walmart really masquerades as a retailer, but they're a supply chain that has to sell stuff to to flush out the the, the end the end of the uh, the end of the chain. And the reason that Walmart has the competitive advantage that it has is their ability to to purchase and move product, and that is uh, uh, the the secret sauce. It's their 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 skill, uh, the cost of, and the speed at which they're able to move products is really the secret to to the leverage and the pricing that they're able to deliver. Ted, I think a great place to start is, can you tell us about the state of supply chains today? There's there's so much going on and it affects every one of us. I would say one word that comes to mind is flux. We are in a state of flux. Um, I think that most of this decade, we're going to be figuring out what a new normal is going to look like if that ever happens. And we're maybe at best midstream through that. Of course, COVID accelerated a lot of trends that were already happening from digitalization and automation to demographic changes. Um, Something we need to talk about today is availability of labor in industrial markets. Um, Governments are changing and compliance laws and sustainability. Geopolitically, I think we're having a a, a re- re, uh, structuring of of what geopolitics looks like. And so all of that impacts supply chains. I think we got kind of complacent thinking that the way things were structured for about 30 years, we could deal with little wrinkles, but hey, this is the way things were always going to stay. And I think now all bets are off. Things have changed a lot. I think it's really interesting to to look over the last, say, 20 or 30 years. Supply chains have been honed to like a razor's edge from an efficiency standpoint. If you Think about it. That's what, you know, Walmart, that's what we prided ourselves on. And then you get this external disruption from, you know, pesky consumers. Like during COVID, I, I remember going on uh, CNBC at the beginning of COVID when there was just talk about toilet paper shortages. Yeah. And like there was no going to be no toilet paper shortage. It's the most predictable product ever, right? Like there's no seasonality to it. There's no time of year or, or occasion that people required people to buy more toilet paper, except people don't listen to that. And they bought more toilet paper and the supply chain had been honed to such a razor's edge from a just in time manufacturing to ship and everything like that. And when customers bought two or three times more than they were supposed to buy, the whole supply chain dried up. And, you know, that's one of the things that I think that we, we've got to, got to understand about, uh, you know, rebuilding or, or, or building the supply chain in the future is how do you deal with, uh, you know, the balance between efficiency and flexibility? When we're having shortages like we had during COVID, then everybody talks about, yeah, resilience, flexibility. That's what we have to focus on. We need to move our supply chains away from this total co- focus on cost. And then things normalize and we start looking at income statements and balance sheets and reports to shareholders. And all of a sudden cost becomes king again. And is it, you know, do we doom ourselves to this continual loop of, well, now we're going to get razor thin again and really efficient until the next major disruption comes along. And then we talk about resilience and flexibility again. I think you got to look at the end to end supply chain and you can find space right in, in it. And a lot of it for me is is in the manufacturing side, Ted. It's like if I think we've got to get back to manufacturing closer to the point of consumption. When you when you've got, you know, you know, massive on the water times in your supply chain, you you, you literally have no flexibility. Yeah. You have the no ability to move product more quickly because of the of the limitation and we saw it in, in containers or in 
you know, it, it, you know, it, when it wasn't containers, it was over the road, and the and the you know the ships were backed up in you know mm-hmm. Long Beach, and and it, 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 and so if if the product was made closer to the point of consumption, and I don't just mean domestic U.S. manufacturing, I mean globally, right? You know, I think it's better for global supply chains, and by the way, global economies. If if products are manufactured closer to where they're con- totally with you, but wait a second though, Bill. COVID was a 100 year thing. Nothing like that could happen again. And then you sit down and you read news about like Houthi rebels. I, I I would love to be sitting with you in a bar right now to say, you know, Bill, two years ago, if I told you that the global supply chain was going to di- be disrupted by Houthi rebels, what well, would you would probably say? Have you been watching Star Wars? You know. And then on the other side of the world, we have you know, a, a forever drought in Panama disrupting the other major choke point in global supply chain. So it's just here to stay. Disruptions are here. I think it's chaos, you know, driven by a whole lot of things of the geopolitical issues, but you know, the emergence of consumer, you know, really solid middle-class consumers in other parts of the world, you know, for, for a long time, it was us in Europe. Yeah. Everybody else was just sort of struggling, but now, you know, you have a really booming consumer in China and in other parts of Asia and in, and, and even in some markets in Africa and then South America where, so there's demand all around the world. It's not just how do we feed the U.S. and Western Europe. To put a bow around that, then it's about chaos. I mean, I think that's the state of supply chains today. And I don't think that's going to change. I think that's the world we live in. So when you describe this as being chaos, can you elaborate on what you mean by that? And at the same time, can you both weave in this psychological aspect of understanding consumers and the impact that consumer expectations have and the assumptions that supply chain supply chain planners make when it comes to sec- consumer psychology? We have a colleague of mine named Tom Goldsby talks about the diabolical consumer because over the last 30 years, Walmart's contributed to this greatly. We have become accustomed to going close by where we live or maybe to our doors to get anything we want in a really short period of time for a pretty good price. And you know, I, I was almost entertained in some of the conversations during COVID when we were getting enraged about not being able to get surf- certain products for a couple of months. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a boomer, right? So I remember the 60s and, you know, our parents would have, if we had parachuted them down into COVID, they'd been like, well, what's different than the way we bought appliances or cars or anything in the 60s? We always had to wait for them. And now we're used to getting everything instantaneously with lots of assortment. And I think that that consumer mentality drives all the decisions that we make in terms of how much inventory we carry, where do we need to go to source products? Bill was talking about needing to go to a more regional approach. We extended our supply chains around the globe in order to find those efficiencies and be able to give consumers what they want for a relatively low cost. And we're dealing with the upshot of that because if you ask any military person, we don't want to deal with global supply chains, right? We want to deal with something that's shorter, but that's what we've been dealing with. And when you have that, you make yourself totally susceptible to disruption. We call it chaos. The, the, the cool term now is VUCA. We live in a VUCA world, which is, I'm going to, I had to write it down because I can never remember. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. It's actually, a, it's actually a military term for planners. I work with a lot of companies now and to watch the, the way that they struggled to understand demand um, over the last, say, you know, 36 months, when there were shortages, um, they, they, you know, coming out of COVID, there was a big boom. And so all their product got, you know, eaten up and there were shortages. And so everybody said, wow, life is great. And they ordered massive amounts of product. And then, you know, you saw the reports from Walmart and Target a couple of years ago with, you know, them missing their inventory targets by, I forget what the number was at Walmart. It was like $2 billion. No, but Two billion dollars worth of inventory is. I mean, like, picture it in your brain. Yeah, um, it, because because without some predictability on the demand side, you're just chasing product all over the place, and that adds so much more of the chaos and volatility that Ted was talking about to the supply chain as the, the consumer reacting to external uh, stimulus, you know, geopolitical issues or pandemics or whatever it might be. 
uh, even even demand that was, and I think in that case caused by some of the stimulus money. Um, and then companies have to react, which puts pressure and chaos into the supply chain and on and on it goes. And then after that, there was a rebound effect as they liquidated the inventory and then it's things slowed down again. And it's just now starting to reach some kind of, I won't say normal, but a little bit more predictable demand cycle. Yeah. I mean, if you think of it all as this big system, right? And and the thing about what Bill was talking about is consumers can respond to stimuli like that, Right. I read it in the newspaper. I see it on TV. I'm going to go out and buy. Maybe I'm going to buy more toilet paper because I might be locked in my house for a few weeks. Um, but supply chains, particularly because we're working with global supply chains that have to ship for weeks on the water, um, are working with with weeks and months. And so you have this kind of relatively slow system of supply trying to stay in tune with this instantaneous demand. And of course, there's going to be gaps. And so what do we do? We build $2 billion of inventory to try to predict what they're going to want. I, I'm on this soapbox lately about one of the best things we could do in business and in supply chain is improve planning. We have all kinds of new tools and data available, but we don't necessarily use them. And we still use old planning systems that look historically at, at historical sales to try to predict the future. And we need to get more responsive to, to what's really happening. We have a question from Twitter from Arsalan Khan, who asks, what is the importance of the data, data collection in supply chains? How can we make supply chains efficient by reducing the data collecting, not replicating data and using AI? Walmart's the king of data, right? Like they have their, their data collection is I think unparalleled. Like they get they there's 150 million Americans a week that go into Walmart stores, and their buying habits are collected on everything from credit cards to cameras to the the point of sale system. And so there's a so much historical data which gives should give you the ability to predict uh, predict demand. And for the most part, they're very very good at it. And the 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 question mentions efficiency of supply chain and. The more efficient you get in a supply chain, as Ted and I were talking about, the more susceptible you are to changes in the data pattern. And so the more you rely on data, the, the better and more efficient you are, but the more susceptible you are. And AI, I think AI is interesting. I don't know exactly what and where it can play in the predictability of the data, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that an AI model wouldn't have foreseen COVID and the reaction to COVID that we took, because you might, AI might be able to foretell uh, a hundred year pandemic. I, I don't know, maybe they can, <laughs> but I doubt that they could predict the reaction that a governor in a particular state would have had, um, you know, one state that shut down and another one that didn't. And all, all that affects the supply chains and the, the flow of product too. And so I think you got to understand and deal with the, 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 the scientific data piece of it, but you also have to understand the human nature that goes with demand and 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 the behaviors of people who are implementing the supply chain. Please subscribe to the CXO Talk newsletter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out CXOTalk.com. We have amazing shows coming up. Ted, would it be accurate to say that the combination of slim inventories and therefore the lack of resilience in the case of some type of shock combined with this reliance on data really is what sets us up for serious problems and disruptions anytime, as Bill says, there's an interruption to the pattern of data. In other words, if things happen differently than we anticipate, the supply chains are screwed. I agree with that. There's an interesting dichotomy of inventory and information um, and speed, really. Um, inventory, we hold inventory because we can't respond quickly because our supply chains are extended. So we hold inventory to kind of be that buffer between what's happening in the real world of demand and how long it takes us to resupply. If we could speed cycle times, we could be much more accurate and be more responsive to demand and, until we get you know, beam me up, Scotty, we're probably not going to be able to get rid of inventory. But if we could get quicker supply chains, we could respond more quickly to demand. And then 
lessen our, our exposure to disruption, lessen our inventory that we have to carry and all those good things. But think about why we don't have quick supply chains. It's because we have outsourced all of our manufacturing to a country, what is it, 8,000 miles away, 10,000 miles away? Um, yeah. You know, so, and then, it, so that adds time to our supply chains. The fact that we have to get things here mainly by ocean carrier adds things to supply chains. We have disruptions that happen at sea. And so we have these long times. I am less negative about the potential of AI to help us with some of this than Bill might be. Um, I have two children who are data scientists, two uh, kids that are data scientists, and they tell me all the time, all AI is is a super powerful regression tool that can capture massive amounts of data, look through it in real time almost, and find patterns. But then to Bill's point, we have to tell it what those patterns mean, and and that sometimes can be a real challenge. The other point to our, our listener's question about data is just like everything else in the world, AI or any other type of powerful analytical tool we use is only as smart as the data we give it. And almost every single IT, supply chain IT project that I've worked on um, has been limited, first of all, by getting good data and being able to marry data from across the supply chain. Walmart, I will say, is one company that is able to do that because of the, the channel power that they have, and they have really good connectivity with suppliers. But even for Walmart, they deal with I don't know, Bill, hundreds of thousands of vendors that can't all give you the, the data that you need to have that visibility and transparency. We're really good at managing disruptions in the supply chain we can predict. That we expect, right? Like we, we every year there's a massive winter snowstorm um, and, you know, Walmart's distribution system is able to shut down one route and reestablish another route. And you know, when hurricane hits, you know, a city or New Orleans like Katrina did, you know, that supply chain and those stores are out, but the system can flex and adjust with secondary routes to to provide to provide product. It's when, you know, like we've had in the last two years, three years since 2020, these global issues that, you know, COVID shut down the world. There was no alter alternative supply chain. Right for that because everybody was shut down. And, you know, as that sort of happens with, with demand, global demand, not just regional demand, like we're, we had in the sixties and seventies, it becomes harder to, to, to re-gear. And I think we're going to be constantly dealing with this. And, and Ted, you mentioned it earlier, this efficiency and cost effectiveness versus, versus flexibility and, and companies will make their decisions based on what they determined to be the most profitable at a particular time. And at the time, it made sense to build $2 billion in inventory. didn't turn out to be the right decision. Um, and so now they've pulled it out again. And I think that's just going to be uh, you know, driven by the companies and, the, and their shareholders' uh, demands for profit. Yeah, 100%. You know, from the time frame from around 2015 for the next few years, I sat in on several companies' risk management scenario planning. And- one of the things that was always in a high likelihood of occurring was a regional pandemic. And we'd had that several times in this millennia, right? At, you know, the, the bird flu in China and swine flu and stuff like that. Um, but none of, none of us said a global pandemic that was going to shut the whole world down. It was all regional. And if you have it regionally, then you can shift around, right? The pandemic as it occurred, you know, if you go back to the 1918 flu, the world didn't shut down. Because we didn't have the, you know, the same leaders and the same ability to understand what was happening across the world in markets, and it just sort of made its way around the world. And um, there were alternate supply chains in that case, but this one, the leaders that were in place made the decisions that they made all across the world and literally closed. Yeah, so that's tough for an AI, an AI model or any model to forecast. Maybe we're victims of our own real-time information in that case, huh? We have uh, another question from Twitter from Chris Peterson, who wants to know, what about using uh, technology such as 3D printing and other on-site manufacturing technologies to bring that manufacturing closer to the point of consumption? In certain product lines and in certain industries, 3D printing is going to uh, is to going to really revolutionize 
our concepts of planning and inventory management because that truly is the the beam me up Scotty um, technology, right? We don't have to have anything here right now. I can come in as a customer and say, I want this and you can make it for me in real time. We've seen it with music and books, right? When's the last time you went into a bookstore? And and Amazon started as a, first of all, as a digital bookstore, bookstore and then as a digital music provider. I still struggle that that in my lifetime, or maybe even younger people's lifetime than me, that we're going to see that for a mass merchant like a Walmart that carries so many products. I mean, the investment in 3D printing would have to be so massive to be able to meet it. But I do think in certain product lines that it's a, a very viable technology. They're using it in manufacturing for internal engine parts right now. I know that. In aircraft, some structural, not outside structural, but interior to the uh, you know the passenger cabin structural components, they're using 3D printing. Not the 737 doors though, right? I hope not. Not the bolts on the 737 doors anyway. Yeah, no, I, we, you know, we started messing around with 3D printing at Walmart 15 years ago. Like, you know, when they, when all they could do was make a chess piece and it took like 24 hours. Right. And I think that in certain product categories, to your point, Ted, people are going to have little 3D printers at their home. Yeah. You know, you're going to buy the CAD cam drawing or the digital version of a coffee cup instead of going and buying the coffee cup. But I think in organic materials like food and other products, I think we're a long, long, long way from that. But I think it's going to be a piece of it. I don't know that it'll completely take it over. Can we go back to this issue of the data? Can you talk about collaboration among supply chain partners and the role of data serving as the, the glue to raise the visibility of supply chains uh, globally. Walmart's you know, retail system um, allows, at, provides access to key suppliers to their database. So, you know, their system is called, was called Retail Link. And, you, you, you know, vendors or suppliers like Procter & Gamble would go in there and into Retail Link and keep track of their product and order it, order the ship to Walmart because it was in everybody's best interest not to have excess inventory in the system, to have the supply chain be as efficient as possible. You know, the manufacturer Proctor in this case didn't want to have the, wanted to have their plants running, you know, as efficiently as possible. Um, you know, they could plan the 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 truck routes and the product arrival at the distribution center, and then the you know Walmart's ability to sort it, and so. The sharing of data um, all the way end to end has been going on since, gosh, since the the eighties. And the the more you do that, the more efficient things are, but the less flexibility you have on everything because everybody runs their supply chains all the way to the to the lowest cost option, and that doesn't provide flexibility. So there's no excess manufacturing capacity in Procter's supply chain for surges that are not predicted because they've honed everything through because they're trying to make as much money as they can as is the, the you know the the over the road carriers and so is so is the retailer and so it, it is that same double edged sword that we're talking about you can you can share data and that's the way to become the most efficient way that you can but the more you share data the more likely that you're going to have no less flexibility in the system I'm going to add a couple other challenges too. And it is all about data, right? It's about visibility and transparency. And companies have been spending lots of money on information control towers that cross, you know, across different entities in the supply chain. But the challenge is, so Walmart and Procter & Gamble can exchange data, but what about Procter & Gamble's supplier, supplier, supplier somewhere in the hinterlands of central China? And that's another lesson we learned in COVID is that we could we could harden our relationships with our tier one suppliers, but ultimately they were buying stuff from somebody somewhere that was shut down. And we don't have really good visibility. Those tend to be smaller companies without sophisticated data capabilities. And unless we're able to really get to the source, then at some point we are still going to have challenges, um, particularly in the transportation realm. A lot of the, the companies that we're using, small trucking companies, for example, don't have that sophistication. And then the other challenge I'll bring up about data, which I think is increasingly important, is the more that we link across the supply chain with data, 
the more we subject ourselves to bad actors. And so cybersecurity becomes really, really important as we try to link up across all these different entities in the supply chain that are probably global players and may not have the same data security that, that some bigger companies have. We've had more data than we know what, known what to do with for a number of years. You know, we used to call it, there was always these, I can't tell you how many meetings I sat in where the topic was big data, like what, you know, that was the buzzword for a while. And now we're, now we're into AI and nobody really knows, knew what to do with big data. I, I, we all, we, talk, we all talked about it and knew we should be doing something with it. Yeah. Um, and now it's AI. And we're, I don't know that anybody's really sure what it is or what it can do. Um, but, but we're talking about it and that's, and that's kind of, I think the progression that we're going in, there's way more data than our, our simple minds have the ability to deal with. And finding that information, finding the nuggets in that data is, is, is really the key. But Bill, I do have to give you credit. I mean, one of the cool things that Walmart has done in, in, um, perishables, for example, is use blockchain. And, and that's all we could spend another couple of hours, Michael, talking about whether that's good or bad or not. But in perishables, Walmart has set up a network with some of their, all the way out to their farmers so that they can identify sources of like breakouts of, of botulism or, or whatever the problem was with romaine lettuce. And I think the first time it happened to Walmart, it took them a matter of weeks to find out where the source was. And after they set up their network with blockchain enabled information, they were able to identify the farm that caused the problem, I think, within minutes, which is really impressive. Yeah, the system is incredible. You know, I guess if you get sued enough, you, you can do anything. <laughs> what about the shift to online retailing? How has that changed supply chain? For one thing, it's made us push inventory a lot. You know, back, back when I started in there, I've been doing this for 34 years. Back when I started, the, the name of the game in warehousing and distribution was centralizing because if we centralized, we could cover a lot more demand areas with a lot less inventory. Um, today, we've gone exactly the reverse, largely because of online, uh, online buying and e-commerce that we've had to push inventory closer and closer to customers so that we can get it to them in the time frame a customer expects to get it um, to deliver to their house. So, so that has caused a lot more uncertainty, a lot more chance for disruption, et cetera, because we've added all these different inventory holding points. The good thing it's done is, I mean, you talk to, if I go out and talk to my undergraduate classes and I ask them where they buy from, they all hold this up, right? And Bill and I might still order from our laptops or maybe even telephone or maybe even get in a car and go buy. But, you know, Gen X, Gen Y's, not, not Gen X, but Gen Z, they order from their phones. And what that makes is real-time demand data instantaneously available. I think it's been really interesting to watch as, as I had a front row seat to the emergence of Amazon. And we would say, oh, that'll make any money. No, I mean, this can't last. Uh, you know, they, they were, you know, a billion in sales. And, you know, we, look, at them, look at them. They grew at 70%. We looked at them again and they go, well, now they're 5 billion in sales, but they don't make any money. And now they're, I don't know, like, I don't even know, six, $700 billion. They still don't make any money at retail and they're still growing. And they've fundamentally changed the dynamic in, in, and it's all about a distribution model. You know, we've built in this country, a distribution system that's based on the, the retail network, the interstate highways and the rail systems that we have. Um, designed to bring, you know, pallets and cases to retail outlets. And now the customer's demanding each is to their door. And that's not what the whole system is set up for. Um, and it's, it, and if you really think about it, it's not possible to send a box of Cheerios to somebody's house as efficiently as it would be to send a tractor trailer load of Cheerios to a retail outlet. Yeah. And so you've got to have to redesign the whole system and the whole, uh, uh, you know, consumer demand model is driving it. Now the consumer is demanding Cheerios at their house from Amazon at the same price that they can get it at the super center a mile away. And that expectation that is be, that's being created by the, the delivery uh, it, it, in, in some cases is just never going to be able to be achieved. And a box of Cheerios, there might be 70 cents worth of margin or, you know, even if you're buying it at, at, at scale, right? And so how do you get 70 cents of margin 
an, to take a box of Cheerios and put it in another box and then mm -hmm. drop those little styrofoam popcorn things in it and then have a person drive it to my house, never mind walk to, to your door. Like the math just never adds up. Bill, I have to ask, what was it like being CEO of Walmart US and observing Amazon as you were describing? It's fascinating. We have a million internal debates about it, right? You know, the even today, even after the pandemic, the the percentage of retail done uh, online in the U.S. is mid-teens, 14%, 15%. That means there's 85% that still done physical retail. One school of thought was, let's just get a bigger share of the 85% because we're good at that. It's it's kind of where we play. The, the other argument was, well, the trend and young people, to Ted's point, are moving digital. If we don't go into that business, um, you know, how, how are we going to compete 40 years from now, or never mind that, 10 years from now. And so that's that was the internal debate as you sat there and watched it and you know kind of watched it play out. And Walmart's done a good job. Uh, many companies have, but Walmart particularly has done a good job trying to deliver both. Um, yeah. Walmart.com has kind of emerged as a, a pretty solid competitor to Amazon. You know, but if you really look at it, to be quite honest with you, in the year I left when uh, e-commerce was a much smaller percentage of Walmart's business. Uh, they made Walmart made twenty nine billion dollars in operating income, and the more they invest in e commerce, the less money they make. It, today <laughs> they make about twenty three billion dollars. Um, so it, they've never never come close to that number. The more they invest in it, the profitability dynamic is completely different. Bill, I remember you saying to me one time in one of our jobs that we did together was, um, you know, if you found out that you were losing money on a particular product, the best thing you could do is introduce them to your competitor. Yeah. Let them lose money on them. Right? Yeah, exactly right. I mean, obviously that has scale issues. You were kidding about that, but. Well, I think the question is, do you want to go out of business fast or do you want to go out of business? <laughs> and so, you know, you can go out of business fast by letting the competitor have the business or you can go out of business slowly by, by being competitive and trying to manage that. I'll tell you, one of the things I thought that Walmart has done brilliantly is buy online, pick up in store. I really enjoy that experience. Um, it's streamlined, fast, easy, especially for big product, bigger products. It's, uh, I think that's been one of the real big um, ahas that Walmart's had in the last 10 years is we can play in e-commerce e without having to deliver to your door, make you still pay for the last mile, but make it really easy on you because there's Walmarts everywhere. Right? I think so, in retail going forward, the winners are going to be the people who are able to deliver the best of both of those worlds, the digital world and the physical world. Physical world has, you know, its roots in immediacy and sensory, right? Like I, I will, I want it now and like now, and I, and I want to touch it or feel the material or smell the fruit and make sure it's smells right. And then, you know, there's nothing, nothing like the search capability digitally. Like if you can pick up your phone and find, you know, Elmer's glue in 15 seconds. But I mean, I spent 10 years in super centers. And if you told me to go find the Elmer's, <laughs> I wouldn't really know where to look. It might be in crafts. It might be in stationary, might be at the checkout on the front end somewhere. I don't know. It's probably in three or four different places, but it'd be, it'd be hard to find it. It'd take 15 minutes. And so if you can figure out how to deliver the best of both of those things, I think you win. How should businesses then approach managing these competing goals of trying to simplify their supply chains, reduce the cost, but at the same time be extremely efficient and fast? I think you hit on a really key word, Michael, and that's simplification. Um, I, I know that consumer is key and customers are key, but I can't tell you how many analyses I've done with companies, particularly consumer goods companies, that have just an absurd number of different stock keeping units in any given particular product line. And you look at the sales of those and you know, well, this product sold once last year to a consumer in Texas. So we need to be fully stocked at all 4,800 Walmart stores with safety stock of that product. And again, I keep, I keep harkening back to COVID. We, it was such a learning laboratory in so many ways. The companies that did really well, I've worked with some companies that are 120-year-old companies, 
and had their best financial years in their history in 2021 and 2022. And one of the reasons was because the supply chain had the strength during this crisis to be able to say, no, we're not going to make all these hundreds of products that nobody's buying. We're going to stick to the volume products that everybody's buying and we have good margin on. And I'm not saying get rid of all kinds of uh, you know innovation and in products, but I think that I'm going to say something really bad here, Bill, so attack me on it. I think that we have gone to an absurd level of marketing and consumer focus and that marketing drives the bus in so many of these decisions and that unless and until marketers get responsibility for end-to-end -end total costs and inventory, they're going to keep saying, let's just keep rolling out products like crazy. By the way, I started my career in marketing and sales. I can say this. Um, until we get some discipline there, we're going to continue to create these super complex systems that the supply chains, we're going to lose money on. Yeah, I agree, Ted, 100%. You know, the, one of the reasons that many companies are more profitable today than they were uh, prior to the pandemic isn't because they're greedy corporations. It's because they limited their SKUs. I saw that in restaurants that I work with and limited their menus and changed the menus and stopped, stopped promoting the level that they were promoting at, you know, reduced SKUs in stores because the key to profitability is velocity and velocity is simplicity. And so the, if you want to know what, what works at Walmart, you don't, if you're a supplier and you bring a product in and it doesn't hit a turn rate that, that, that is accretive to the business, you're out. You, you know, the, the whole key to Walmart is you build a footprint, and, and this is any supply chain, you build a footprint, and then you force as much velocity through that footprint as you possibly can, because every extra case you move through your system is leveraged profit. It's, it comes at, it, it, it's, it's marginal cost. It's not total cost, because yep. the system's already in place. If you can move velocity, nobody can, somebody who's, somebody who's got to build a supply chain can't ever compete with somebody who already has one. And so if you could just increase your turns by making it more efficient, you'll, you'll, you'll be successful. And by the way, I think that's what also gives you supply chain flexibility because you don't have, you don't have as many, you know, you know, diet, cherry, whatever. Ah, yeah. You know, Cokes in the system, you just got Coke and Diet Coke and you probably get 80, 90% of your business or you probably end up with 100% of your business anyway, um, because nobody would know that there was ever a cherry diet. My wife will sometimes send me to um, a mass merchant uh, retailer to find hair care products. And I get to that aisle and the number of choices, obviously you can tell that I don't often shop in the hair care aisle. And when I do, it just blows me away. It's like, how could you possibly have all these different options and choices? And it's just crazy. But Bill, aren't you then fighting the psychology of consumer demand and consumer expectations because consumers want to go in and see a hundred redundant products on the shelves for whatever psychological basis there exists for that. But that's what people want. It, it appears. I think as a business, you got to know what you want to be, what you're famous for, and then, and then deliver it. It, you know, there are businesses that thrive on variety. Um, there are businesses who are famous for premium, like Tiffany's, you know, or Nordstrom's is a, is a retailer. Um, and then there's businesses that are driven by price, like Walmart, and prices scale. And so you can have, you know, a, and Walmart has a broad assortment. There's, you know, 300,000 SKUs in a super center. Um, but do they have everything? They don't. Um, if I bring you everything, I can't bring it to you at the cost that I that I'm famous for. And you know, we've tried to, you know, manipulate that at, many times at Walmart. You know, adding SKUs, um, and you get a short term lift, um, but you don't get the throughput and that that you that you need in order to be profitable, um, or you know, to to be accretive. You're, you're profitable, um, and we've tried reducing SKUs to the point where. You know, you just give them, you know, the 80-20 rule, and that doesn't really work either. But you, you got to know what you're famous for, and you got to be able to deliver it. And there are businesses that can thrive um, based on variety. And I, I would always tell people, yeah, if you want to, if you want to be a, a hardware store in the same plaza as Walmart selling hammers, 
you're going to lose because Walmart got 20 hammers and they're all the lowest price hammer you're ever going to come up with. Um, but if you want to compete with Walmart and show people how to build a, a fence or, you know, a, a, a shed or do the woodworking or, or replace their plumbing, you're going to, you're going to really thrive. And then maybe you can sell a hammer or two at a price. So be famous for service. That's not Walmart's game. Some, some businesses can thrive on delivering service. And I think that's really what it is. What do you want to be famous for? And what does the customer expect from you? Arsalan Khan comes back and he says, as more and more aspects of business move towards tech to technology, do you think that executives need to be tech savvy or is it just the CIO's job? And can a CIO really change supply chain or have an impact on company culture? I think senior executives need to know what they don't know. And it, you can't know everything. I mean, the scope of business just grows on a daily basis of what you need to know and have expertise at. And you can't know it all. So you have to know what you don't know and then have trusted people in place that tell you what you need to know to make good decisions. Um, I do think CIOs can impact culture. I think increasingly technology is is expanded across all areas of the business and um, it can't be a standalone. It needs to be integrated with the business. I think most decisions need to be business decisions and then the information group needs to execute on those decisions and not drive the decisions. I've seen too many bad decisions driven by IT because this is the best platform and then nobody knows how to use it or it's not the right use. So that's my quick answer on that. I think technology is becoming a given. You know, it used to be a thing and now it's just, you know, part of your daily life. And uh, does a CIO know? Uh, yeah, C CEO needs to be tech savvy, um, but, he, but he or she also needs to be a, a really good leader, um, a, a, a great strategist, uh, a good operator, if you have a, a huge operation, um, a, a overall, you know, probably more than anything, a great selector and developer of talent. Yeah. You know, which one of those is more important? You know, I probably would say tech would, you know, be secondary to some of those other ones, provided that you've got support in your organization for it. And that as a leader, you're, you're, uh, you're acknowledging its, its role in your business. We have another question from Twitter. This is from Wes Andrews. And this is a more difficult question, I think. And he says, as a former military planner and now a data analytics transformation enabler, he says, given the uncertainty associated with geo geopolitical situations, the Houthis in the Red Sea, COVID and so on, where and how do you see business integrating data and geopolitics into their structures? One of the things that I've been critical of business about pre-COVID was risk management. Um, risk management tended to be a thing we we pulled. I'm talking about in operations, not necessarily, you know, in uh, in finance or you know those kind of areas, insurance. Um, but we pull it together, a group of experts, once or twice a year, and we put together a really good report of the things that are potentially going to disrupt us and the likelihood and impact they would have. And we'd give them to people like Bill and make a presentation at an executive uh, committee meeting, and it'd be really pretty. And then we'd put it up on the shelf and go operate the way we've always operated and and then just react as things happen. And I think that companies are are taking risk management much more seriously, making it a, a dynamic process owned by a C-level leader. And when that happens, um, analytics, advanced analytics, uh, natural language type things like looking at Facebook and Twitter slash X feeds to see what people are saying and using that to, to try to capture real-time trends is, is I, I think, where we're going to try to understand. Uh, IBM has a really good risk management package and supply chain that has natural ca language capability, and it's able to say, hey, you know, we have a distribution center in this valley in California, and we're monitoring Facebook and social media feeds, and we're saying, we're hearing things like, my family has farmed this valley for four generations, and we've never seen rain like this. Well, if we hear that enough, 
might we tell our client who runs that distribution center, you're going to have flooding and you better prepare to, you know, to flow product to, to um, different areas than that particular distribution center. So I think that there is a marriage there between um, the, the geopolitics. That's a domestic example, but we could use that geo, uh, uh, globally as well and the data capture capabilities. I think we're too slow to react sometimes. Um, you know, recently we've seen uh, in the last few years some a little bit of an exodus from China from as a manufacturing basis in, into other parts in Asia and in Central America particularly. Um, and I think, you know, that's probably good. Not, it's not good for China, but it's probably good to, I don't, I don't mean that, I'm not, not, not making a political statement. I'm just talking about from a diversification of, of location from a supply chain perspective. But I do believe it's really important for businesses and business leaders not to take a side in these very contentious geopolitical issues, uh, you know, that are going on. Like we got to serve as a, as a, as a business, whatever customer wants to buy from us, um, you know, within reason and build a business that can be resilient regardless of what's happening in the world. And, you know, I always say if you have a business that requires a particular party to be in power in order to be successful, you're going to be, you're going to, you're going to stink 50% of the time. You got to build a business that can, you know, operate effectively regardless of what's happening, uh, happening around the world or politically in your own, in your own country. And definitely geopolitically from a risk management standpoint, we are seeing what Bill said. Uh, most companies are talking about a China plus. We do so much with China. We're not going to completely get out of it, but a China plus. So where else besides, in addition to China, we're seeing um, massive foreign direct investment in India, um, Malaysia, Vietnam, um, Eastern Europe, Mexico has become a big winner as, you know, to touch back on Bill's early point about more regional regionalization of supply chains as well. So we are reacting to some of the geopolitical things happening in the world. Interestingly, a lot of that foreign direct investment is coming from Chinese companies. So like, okay, you're not going to buy from us in China, but maybe you'll buy from us in our Indian operation or our Mexican operation. Elizabeth Shaw says, how can supply chains create value and what does that value look like? And Arsalan Khan says, if you were to magically create a new supply chain, what would you like to create in terms of people, processes, and even new technology? So they're both talking about the fundamental value drivers of supply chains. If you go back to the early 1800s, the, uh, the original economists in Europe talked about how an organization creates value. And there's four ways. One is to figure out what the needs are out there that potential customers or segments that customers have. What does it take to fulfill that need and what are they willing to exchange for it? So that's, that's a marketing and sales job, right? And then the other value providers are then creating that form and putting it where and when a customer wants it. That's all supply chain. So supply chain hat creates value. If you don't have a supply chain, you can't you can't deliver on the exchange you've created and you'll be out of business pretty quickly. So supply chain creates value fundamentally. Now, how does it create additional value? I think companies are getting really sophisticated about how they can use additional service. Um, you know, Bill talked about the, the hardware store in the plaza with Walmart, right? Well, can we do service type things? Um, Home Depot delivered or uh, realized a long time ago that you know delivery and setting up your washing machine and your dryer and things like that have a great value. So we can be innovative about how we use supply chains to create value. To Arsalan's question, man, Arsalan, that's a you know, we, we you need to get here to University of Tennessee and we'll spend a couple of years together as a doctoral student. We can try to figure that out. But how to build a whole new supply chain? I think. Companies that have a green field have an advantage because they can look at all the things we've talked about and, and, uh, and, and try to use the best knowledge that we have today. But most companies don't have that advantage. We have suppliers in certain locations. We got to put things on trucks or trains or boats or airplanes, and we got to work with vendors all over the world. And it's ultimately what does our customer drive us to do? How does the increasing emphasis on sustainability affect supply chains? It's customer driven. And, you know, we at Walmart, we, we try, we've been involved in sustainability for a long time and have had 
uh, a huge successes and huge failures. The successes are related to things that matter to the consumer, and the failures are related to things that we kind of engineer. It kind of goes to the how do you redesign a supply chain? We don't. The customer does, does demand does, and then we respond to the customer's demand. It, let me give you an example. You know, we tried those uh, curly Q light bulb things. I forgot the what what are the what do we what do they call those? I, don't I know. have some in my in my oh. Shell <laughs> that was gonna that was gonna save the world, save the planet, and they didn't last the long as they were supposed to. They cost eight dollars a bulb, and they put out this really eerie looking light. Right, so they didn't they didn't stick. Nobody bought them. But when we got together with Procter and Gamble and some of the suppliers, and we took water out of the uh, the uh, bottle of um, laundry detergent and sort of shrunk it down. Um, it was a bit about a re-education of the consumer. It was a little bit about convincing the supplier it's okay to have a smaller facing uh, shelf space because it, it'll really matter. The consumer bought it. It saved us money in our supply chain, and it was effective for the supplier, and everybody wins. And I think sustainability as well as the redesign question, it, it, when it's a win for the supplier, a win for the you know supply chain, and a win for the consumer, it, it sticks. And so I think you got to look for sustainability solutions that really add value to the customer, as well as uh, as as well as everybody involved in the product. And those yeah. work. One, the other ones that are done, you know, because somebody thought it was a good idea, often don't often don't stick. Yeah, we talk about something called the triple bottom line, that it's got to be good for the business's economy, the economics and finances, and then good for the environment, and then good for society. And if you can get all those to align, it's a great thing. Um, supply chain happens to own most of an organization's operations. So if we can be more efficient in transportation by filling trucks up better and routing them more uh, in a more optimal fashion, if we can cut waste from manufacturing, cut waste from packaging, those are all really good things that save a company's bottom line and increase margin, also have really great impact on sustainability uh, issues. And so we see some really innovative things happening. My favorite one... Um, this is a, uh, a European brewing company. I didn't know this. It takes about four units of water to make a unit of beer because of all the cleaning and everything you have to do. And their sustainability effort was on making it only take a unit and a half of water to make a unit of beer. And that has, you know, you got all that less wastewater that has a sustainability effect on the environment. How are we doing with ethical sourcing? That's another one of those things where I said it, you have to know not only what's happening with your immediate supplier, because usually if, if Walmart's buying from Procter & Gamble, Procter & Gamble has great ethical sourcing things in place and they're probably doing all the right things. But as you get up from, from um, Procter & Gamble's supplier to their supplier to their supplier, you know how far up do we need to get that transparency to find out where really unethical things are happening? And I think that's where companies get in trouble. You know, It's, it's the, the extended supply chain further up. Yeah, I agree, Ted. I think increasingly in a world where there's uh, cell phone cameras everywhere and uh, immediacy of information and data, um, it's it's becoming easier, not easy, to, to keep track of what's going on with your suppliers and their subcontractors. And it's also becoming more and more difficult for you know outrageous things to keep happening, um, and yet somehow they still keep happening. So. I don't think that task is ever um, is ever over. Yeah. I think it's driven by a tone at the top more than anything else. And if you know all the way through the system, you ask the questions and you try to put the best uh, the you know the best um, you can do onto the table, the organization typically responds to that. And uh, you know even then it doesn't always work, and you have uh, issues that you have to deal with. It's also really important, I think, um, in what you do in a failure as much as you is how you try to avoid failure. So if you have the systems in place and the processes in place and yet still failures will happen, what do you do about it? And, and you know, for me, those are all important aspects. You know, government regulations are driving us towards that as well, especially in the EU. They're 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 creating regulations that cause companies, even big companies that are customer facing to move up their supply chain to try to justify their sourcing of, of different suppliers. 
And we'll probably see that here. There's even unethical, ethical traders, right? So, you know, fair trade coffee that's not really fair trade coffees. Bam. Bam. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Right. As we finish up very quickly, let me ask each of you for your concluding thoughts or advice to business people when it comes to wisdom for vis- business people when it comes to thinking about supply chains. Uh, Ted, you want to go first? Supply chain management is the deliverer of your end value. Everything else in the organization is there to either support creation of value or create the order, right? Get customers to come in. That unless you have a good supply chain, you're not going to be able to deliver on that value you've promised. So we need to understand that and make it a strategic part of the organization, have it be something that is closely intertwined with the company's strategy and and understanding of who we are and what we do. The other thing I would say is that we need to be smarter about total cost and not drive the supply chain to just total unit cost efficiency, because that causes us to make some some really bad decisions that end up biting us. Uh, and we've talked about a lot of examples of that. And we live in an increasingly, we use the word early, chaotic world, and our supply chains need to be able to be resilient to deal with that increasing chaos. That's that's here to stay. We didn't talk about labor. We, we live in a world where we have shrinking labor force, and it's going to be with us forever. It's not short term. So how do we develop the talent to do these kinds of things? That's a big issue as well. The front end of your business in, in retail, if you have a state or a division or a group of stores that aren't doing well, you, you can survive it. Um, you can figure out how to make it up, make up for it somewhere else. But a vibration in your supply chain affects 100% of your business. And if your supply chain is 5% less efficient than it needs to be, that translates to a substantial impact at your top line and your bottom line. And so every business, as Ted said, the core or the spine of your business is, is your supply chain. And, you know, leaders, business leaders who don't understand that or don't focus on that are doomed uh, to suffer the consequences of it. Um, as I said, when I opened, I think Walmart's benefit and doesn't come from its purchasing power scale. It does a little bit. It comes from its ability to efficiently and effectively distribute product in a in a in a incredibly efficient manager manner at a high velocity, and that's where that's where they make they make their living. And so I would encourage people to focus on that, um, and 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 as a deliverable, look for improvements in the supply chain. And with that. I want to say a huge thank you to Ted Stank and Bill Simon. Gentlemen, thank you both for sharing your expertise and, and wisdom with, with us today. I really, really do appreciate you both. Yep, you do it. Yep, thanks, Michael. It was fun. Everybody, thank you for watching. We will see you again next time. Before you go, please subscribe to the CXO Talk newsletter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out CXOTalk.com. We have amazing shows coming up. Have a great day, everybody.